Hey guys, this is Lawrence of the Ketones and Coffee Podcast. Make sure to subscribe down below so you don't miss out on any of this great content. Our next guest is a registered dietitian and a primal health coach. She is a cancer survivor since 2018, which started her exploration to do her own research and discovered the science of cancer metabolism, which also has led her to develop and use a protocol of ketogenic diet with targeted therapeutic fasting to significantly impact her response to chemotherapy. She is now helping others see cancer differently, which can be an experience that will give you strength, wisdom, and more love for your body and life than ever before. She also has written a book titled Hacking Chemo, Using Ketogenic Diet, Therapeutic Fasting, and a Kick-Ass Attitude to Power Through Cancer Treatment. Can't wait to dig in to that. But first, this episode is brought to you by Basic Keto Box. Basic Keto Box is a premium subscription box for keto dieters. It includes a wide variety of healthy keto options delivered to your door. So make sure to check out basicketo.ca to learn more. And without further ado, I'm honored to be joined by Martha Tettenburn. Martha, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Um, Matt, your book, Hacking Chemo, is, is such an amazing read. Uh, you know, I just love books that are in-depth in stories, in, in our experiences, and which is why we're here, right? Because of that love of sharing stories, and it brings us all together here. Um, and, and guys, for guys that, that's listening, in this episode, my goal is for people to find the story, find Martha's story, because uh, hope is something that can get lost in an expe- unexpected event, right? And, and we find comfort in stories that talks strength. And, and I can assure you, Martha's story talks strength and when we're most vulnerable, guys. So I'm here talking to like-minded individuals like Martha uh, and, and to share all of our stories. You, you guys... Uh, need to find this book on Amazon. I will link everything down below in the description. This book is actually also a self-help book and a recipe book following Martha's story. So uh, I'll get into Martha's story in a second. Just to preface your story, Martha, here with our listeners, in 2018, you were diagnosed with stage one ovarian cancer. And, and, and I think your natural inclination to alternative medicine, being a dietitian and a health coach, led you to this path of really testing theories and finding success within your own journey. Um, and then you discovered that with fasting before treatments and being on strict ketosis during treatments, aid much of the symptoms of chemo and also, correct me if I'm wrong, also the effectiveness of keto, uh, chemo in general. But before we get into that, because I'd love to focus on the tools you've used to get through chemo to power through cancer, which is, I think is super important because fear itself actually does a lot of damage too, right? I am so grateful for you for coming on to share this story. So can you tell us about your background and what you were doing leading up to your discovery that you have cancer? Sure, sure. So um, your readers can't see me, but I am significantly older. (laughs) Um, I was 58 uh, in 2018 when I was diagnosed. Um, I've always been really healthy. I've been a dietitian for over 30 years. And, um, and in the last 10, 12 years prior to diagnosis, I had sort of discovered the field of low carb. And um, after using it personally, and doing a lot of research as to why it was so much more powerful than the stuff I had been trained to do, um, that I decided to put some extra effort in, I got the primal health coach um, certification so that I had a more in-depth knowledge of the low carb. And, uh, and I was really felt like I was living my best life. Um, I, uh, it was the middle of summer and a girlfriend sent me a text message and said, so what are you up to on your plank? Cause she was uh, working out and she had been encouraging me to work out. And uh, I hadn't, done a plank in probably six weeks. I had been kind of lazy, you know, getting lazy. Um, I had had started running again, which is really my first love is just sort of long, slow running. I've done a lot of half marathons over the last 20 years. 
Um, so I just got also over some injuries and was starting to run again. And, uh, I laid down on the floor to do a plank and discovered that there was a bulge in my lower belly that had never been there before. Um, and I'm not someone to kind of pretend it didn't happen. So I literally sat up and called the doctor <laughs> and, uh, and, um, it was about five days later that I got an ultrasound and, uh, they said it was a very large ovarian cyst. It was about 16 centimeters across when they found it. Um, so that's about six inches for the American listeners. Um, and, uh, it continued to grow over the next couple of months until I had surgery to have it removed, but nobody thought it was cancer. There was no real indication that it was cancer. There is a blood marker that can be done for ovarian cancer. And mine was just barely above um, the normal range. And it's not considered a really great test. So nobody, nobody thought it was cancer. So we did laparoscopic surgery, which means they went in through a tiny little incision and they ruptured this big balloon that in the end held 1.5 liters of fluid. So that's about the size of a bag of milk if you're in Canada. Um, and, uh, and they took it out. And then six days later, they called me and said, oh, by the way, well, first of all, they said, the surgeon wants to see you come tomorrow morning, bring your husband. And I knew immediately that that was not good. So, um, so yeah, I, uh, I found out that I had stage one C high grade serous ovarian cancer. So not the good kind of cancer, um, in terms of types of ovarian cancer, but on the other hand, they caught it very early. And for that, I feel like I have been really blessed because, about three quarters of women who get diagnosed with ovarian cancer catch it late, stage three or four. And it's considered quite a, a deadly cancer because of that. Um, our ovaries are buried so deep inside our body. They are like the most precious part of our uh, reproductive system. Of course, they carry the eggs. So um, so anything that happens to them, it, it can be hard to diagnose. It, it, there's no clear lump or anything like it, like there is in breast tissue or some of the other areas that are more obvious. Um, so yeah, so that started me down the path of um, preparing to, you know, kind of take that laying down because I was already a Quite a renegade and uh sorry to cut you off i'm, lo I'm losing uh our connection hang on hello Hi, sorry, I lost you. I can't hear you. There. Okay, here we go. I think that's okay. So that's I'm now on the webcam. Do I sound okay? okay? Yeah, you, you sound okay. Yeah, you, you're good. What at what point did did it cut out? Uh, at the point of when you were saying uh, you were preparing um, after the diagnosis, you, that's when I lost you. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, so yeah. Um, so after your diagnosis, uh, what were you feeling at the time? What, and and, and uh, what was your mindset going into that uh, uh, visit? Because you said you knew uh, that it can't be 
Good. I, I knew it wasn't good. I work, I mean, when you work in healthcare, you get this stuff, right? I mean, I knew I wasn't, it you know, wasn't going to be good news and I was pretty sure what it was going to be. Um, I was, it was really interesting actually, because a lot of my identity was wrapped up in, in being healthy in being a dietitian and being a health coach. I had a private practice doing low carb nutrition for awesome aging, um, you know, chronic disease prevention, that kind of stuff. And so to get hit with a chronic disease myself felt like a bit of a slap in the identity. And, um, and so it, uh, it really kind of rocked my world in terms of my own sense of, of um, well, I felt pretty darn in fault, um, invincible, really. And uh, I was, I, I look back on it now and realize I was pretty darn smug, actually, about my health. And, um, and so I felt very vulnerable and that was, I don't know, that was scary. Um, the other thing that was really scary for me was that I was being recommended chemotherapy and chemotherapy just scared the pants off me. It, it's poison. Um, you know, the, the side effects and stuff are just awful. And my body, because I've been so healthy all my life, my body was really drug naive, very, very, I mean, I've probably taken a dozen Tylenol a, a year, you know, so I take nothing, basically, vitamin D in the winter, that's the sum total of my pill intake, basically. And so I was terrified of, of chemotherapy. And that was really what set me off to look for um, what I could do for myself. I knew I was going to take chemo. I'm not against Western medicine or, um, you know, that, there, that there's important precedent for it in certain situations, but I wanted to see what I could do to make myself um, less vulnerable to the side effects and to um, be able to heal from this. Um, so, so that's so when I... I want to know, Martha, were you given options or... Um if what happens if you don't go through chemo do you know oh yeah no i was i was not forced into this by any means um i i live about three hours from the nearest big cancer center so we we were referred to a large center um i met with a radiation or a chemo, um, gynecological oncologist um he was the surgeon and he ran the chemo and everything he was he was a one-stop guy which is great and he explained to me that because the tumor was removed before I even knew it was a tumor, um, what we were chasing with chemotherapy was individual rogue cancer cells. So it's sort of like having a, he described it like having a bag of flour dropped on the kitchen floor and the, and the flour just kind of goes poof and it's everywhere and it's in every nook and cranny and it's on every surface and you know cleaning it up is just like hell on wheels. And so that's the kind of situation that I was potentially in because of having had the cyst ruptured inside my abdomen. Um, so as he said to me, like, we're kind of doing this on faith. You, you can't see the individual cancer cells to know that they're there and you can't see them to know that they're gone after the chemo. Um, but the chance is there it's considered a spill because it was ruptured. And um, the type of, of cancer that I had is the kind that likes to um, have cells kind of adhere to the walls of your internal organs, your pelvic organs, your abdominal wall, um, the omentum, which is that fatty pad in your abdomen that kind of protects your internal organs. And then it seeds new tumors in those places. Um, and so basically, I was given the option of chemo. I was strongly encouraged to take it. And, uh, but no, nobody ever forced me because like I said, the, the tumor was gone before I realized I had a diagnosis. And, and you, you touched upon the fear uh, you had uh, about chemo because many people opt out of chemo for many different reasons. And 
I don't know if we can generalize cancer because of many different factors, you know, type of cancer placement, uh, it's aggressive nature, but there can be a generalized idea of people uh, about it. You know, you get sicker, there's, there's no guarantees, uh, you enter the worst days of your life since your quality of life is affected. And there's so much fear about it and that becomes a survival pact factor in itself and and i love that you're here you've talked about going through surgery to uh shortly after you started chemotherapy and you went through it for six rounds right six rounds six rounds yep and i had two drugs one was put in through an iv mm -hmm. um and the other one was put in as a direct wash of my um pelvic and abdominal cavity so I actually had a port that was put in underneath um, or on my rib cage. So not, not in the usual port position that's up in your shoulder that goes into a vein. This one actually drained directly into my abdomen and they poured the second drug in um, and let it sort of slosh around in there because the, again, because of the kind of uh, cancer cells that we were trying to eliminate. Um, so it took about, I was usually in the chemo suite for at least eight hours um, each time I did the cycle and the cycle happened every three weeks. And let's talk about the, the research you've done uh, after, after that. Um, did you dig into the research right after uh, your visit? Uh, what, what happened next? Um, so when I decided I was doing chemotherapy, I went home and I started doing a whole lot of looking um on the internet you know good old dr google and uh and that's when i discovered that there is a whole field of science that has been just kind of rejuvenated in the last 20 or 25 years um, looking at the metabolism of cancer and how it's different from our healthy metabolism our, our normal cell metabolism um, this stuff was known in the 1920s uh, most of the research the background research was done in the 1920s. And in fact, one of the researchers won a Nobel Prize for delineating this altered metabolism of cancer. But then it got lost um, for a couple of reasons. One in that we um, then found the structure of DNA, Watson and Crick. Um, and it became obvious very quickly that cancer has damaged DNA. And so the entire machinery of the cancer industry moved away from metabolism and into um, looking at, at genetic aspects of cancer. The, the idea of cancer having a disordered metabolism literally just fell on the dust heap of history and, and got lost until just sort of the mid, mid to late nineties when some research started in that field again. There are a couple of researchers who are doing really important work in that area um, and how it can be used in cancer treatment. Um, one of them is a Dr. Thomas Seyfried who is at Boston in Boston and he has done a lot of work with, um, with looking at, at how cancer cells utilize uh, fuel sources. Mm. And basically, when, we, when our healthy cells burn energy, we burn them in our mitochondria, which is the little organelle, a little furnace inside your body, your, each individual cell that breaks down um, fuel, whether that's fatty acids or glucose um, or ketones, if you have ketones, um, and it, it breaks them down into ATP, which is energy. And in cancer cells, the, the mitochondria tends to be damaged and disorganized. And so cancer will preferentially use a much more ancient, much simpler process that is called fermentation, cytoplasmic fermentation. So it's a chemical reaction that actually takes place in the fluid of the cell. And it's very, very quick. Um, it produces a lot less ATP. It's, it's very inefficient in terms of how much energy you get out of each molecule but it's very fast. Um, we use it when we have a fight or flight response. So when you have the, you know, when you're, you're running from the saber tooth tiger and you have that adrenaline response, mm. your body fuels its muscles for running away um, with this cytoplasmic fermentation. Mm. Or if you're 
exercising so hard that you are producing the lactic acid burn in your muscles, that's also that process because one of the side um, or the um, one of the byproducts of that is lactic acid. So, um, so cancer cells have this disordered metabolism and this process that happens in the cell can really only work well with glucose, which is sugar. Um, so cancer cells require a lot of sugar to do their job. And of course, cancer cells cannot turn off their need for growth. They are always, that's one of the hallmarks of cancer. They have no off switch. They are always hungry. They are always looking for uh, what they need to grow because that's, that's their, that's their thing. And um, so they always need cancer. They always need glucose and they always need insulin, which is how glucose gets inside the cell. Mm. So when you, when you look at metabolism, you're looking at fuel partitioning, what, you know, where your body, how and where your body fuels itself. And when you're looking at fuel, you're looking at nutrition. So it just kind of, when I started looking into this, it came right back to where I totally geek out anyways, which is nutrition. And, um, and it turned out that lo and behold, if you could change the level of insulin and the level of glucose in your body and keep it low, you could really stress these cancer cells. They can't get what they want. And that makes them stressed. Thomas Seyfried calls that the press. He has a press pulse theory and the press is pressure. And so if you put this negative pressure on cancer cells, they're always stressed because they can't get what they absolutely need, which is that glucose, right? Um, and then while they're stressed, you pulse them, you, you hit them with some sort of treatment and they are more vulnerable to the treatment because of being under pressure. Um, and the treatment could be chemotherapy, it could be radiation, it could be hyperbaric oxygen, high dose vitamin C. There's all kinds of, you know, both traditional and alternative um, treatments that could be that, that pulse. Um, so I was fascinated by that concept. And of course, it fit right in with everything I already knew about low carb and ketogenic diets and all that kind of stuff. So I formulated a plan for myself that was going to involve um, keeping my insulin and my glucose as low as possible. And that involved being on a strict ketogenic diet for the entire time that I was in chemotherapy. Um, and that's what I did. No, you, you know, I was just, I, I just had uh, this gentleman on the show. He also had uh, that been diagnosed with cancer and there are, there are no talks about changing his lifestyle. Uh, there's, there are no recommendations um, when it comes to his, uh, his diet. And so this is something that I think what you talked about, you know, cancer metabolism is something that needs to be uh, explained to that individual uh, that, you know, with, with a diagnosis, I think this goes uh hand in hand with a diagnosis here here's here's how cancer works right well why why does that why that doesn't happen often like why can't we oh a... nobody knows and i mean it doesn't fit with the current dogma which is you know low carb healthy healthy foods you know but i mean there's no i mean i trained in the 1980s that was when I went to university and low, low fat was like cutting edge new science at that point. Cause that was right when all the, you know, low fat recommendations were being put in place for the entire population. Um, and I practiced that way for 20 years. And I can tell you as a dietitian that basically all we were told about cancer was that you needed to help people to not lose weight. There was nothing about impacting the cancer itself. It was basically supporting the patient to survive treatment um, without orphan their brains out or without, you know, becoming cachectic. And we thought cachexia was all about calories um, because we thought everything was all about calories. And uh, so that's all I knew. And that's still the, the party line in dietetics and and i mean my my 
exposure to the cancer um, world as a, as a patient or a client, I was never given, I mean, I was given the option of talking to a dietitian if I felt like I needed one, one of the cancer center dietitians, but I know what they would have given me um, because I've been there. I'm part of the system myself, right? Um, so no, this, this is, this is why I wrote the book because I was, I was gobsmacked that as a dietitian, I didn't know this stuff. And I mean, I, I've been around the block a few times. I'm, I'm not new, right? And, and the new ones aren't being taught this either, the young ones. Um, and, and I was angry that, that there's these things that we can do that really, really impact on our own ability to manage the chemotherapy side effects in particular, um, but also to feel like we have a sense of control in a basically um, you know, overwhelming situation. Right. That's where sort of the kick ass attitude part of the title comes in as well, because because this is so empowering. You have something you can do for yourself that is um, going to have a major impact on how well you manage the side effects of chemotherapy. Um, it's I mean, I should probably say that that one of the things that I did because of the research I did was to fast for 72 hours um, around each of my chemo treatments. So I would start about 36 hours before chemo, and then I would continue it for 24 hours after chemo. And in my case, chemo was an entire day. It wasn't just an hour or two of an you know, infusion. Um, so it ended up being 72 hours and that would do a couple of things that would put me deeply into ketosis. So, you know, the numbers would go, go way up. Um, and when you fast, what your healthy body does is it goes into kind of a quiescent mode, a, a maintenance mode, it's, you know, it's not actively working at growth and, and the cells just all kind of quiet right down and they wait for fuel because that's a basic, you know, millions year old survival mechanism. Um, they're not unfueled because I have ketones in my body. So the parts that have to have it, like my brain and stuff, they're all fine. Um, they're being supplied by ketones, but cancer cells can't use ketones. They can't use, um, most fatty acids. They manage with glucose and to a smaller extent, glutamine, which is one of the amino acids. Um, and so I was able to fast for those 72 hours, put my, my healthy cells into what I called stealth mode. Um, and the really cool thing about that is that chemotherapy drugs are generally a fairly blunt weapon. They are designed to disrupt fast growing cells and, and they will disrupt them at a couple of different places in that process, depending on what drug they are. But if your healthy cells aren't actively metabolizing, then the chemotherapy literally misses them. It just, they fly, you know, they, they're under the radar sort of thing. And the chemo will go right past them and head for those cells that have the big red flashing lights that go, you know, open for business, we're working, you know, we're, we're metabolizing. And so your healthy cells don't get smacked up the same way that they would if they were actively um, metabolizing. And what happened in my experience, and I was taking drugs that were expected to have, you know, be fairly significantly hard. Um, and I had, I never threw up in six treatments. I never once threw up. I had minimal nausea. Um, I hardly had to take any of the extra drugs that help with nausea. Um, in fact, every treatment got a little easier than the one before. And that's absolutely opposite to what was expected. Um, I never had mouth sores, which is one of the most common side effects because the, the cells in your body that are still actively growing in an adult, in children, yeah, lots of things are growing, but in an adult, the parts of your body that are still actively in kind of a growth mode are things like your hair follicles. And that's why you lose your hair with many of the chemo drugs. Um, the, uh, the bone marrow that produces all the components that make up your blood cells, 
like your immune system cells and your red blood cells and your white blood cells and your platelets and so on. Um, your bo so your bone marrow is always producing stuff. And, um, and the, the lining of your GI tract is always turning over as well, which is why you get symptoms like nausea and, and mouth sores and um, diarrhea and constipation and all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, my, oh, and neuropathy was another common side effect, which is nerve damage in your fingers and toes. I was terrified of that because it can take months to, to um, go away if you have it. And I never got any. Um, so my experience was so dramatically different than what I was um, told to expect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I, I want to ask you at what point, because you have this confidence uh, getting, getting into it, um, started fasting right off the bat and, and started keto uh, with your knowledge as a dietitian, as a primal health coach, at what point in your journey that you can say that, okay, I, I can beat this thing. At what point in your journey that you're so confident you could beat this thing? Because I know you've delved into the science of it. You've you've read uh, studies uh, from you know uh, people that are uh, uh, leading the science of this. At what point in your journey that you can say that you can beat this? You know, when I finished the first treatment, because I had no idea what was happening. So I mean, the first one is always really kind of scary and stressful because you're going into this big cancer center. And, you know, you get, you get shifted through the system, you become a number, right? You get shifted through the system from pillar to post. And then I came home and I had about four days of yeah, feeling really low, um, low energy. Um, I, I was never horizontal. I was, I never had to spend time in bed or anything like that. Um, I had a recliner chair in, in my living room. I've never owned a recliner before. I actually went out and bought a recliner after my first surgery. I realized I was going to need one. And um, so I made this little kind of nest for myself in the living room and I would spend my, my time there. Um, and then every hour or two, I'd get up, I'd maybe empty the dishwasher or I make some bacon and eggs. Sometimes that was all it was for supper with bacon and eggs. Um, but I made all the meals. Um, I, you know, maybe walk out to the end of the driveway and check the mail and, you know, just little jobs. And then I climb back in my chair. Mm -hmm. So I was low energy for four or five days. And then after that, I could feel my energy coming back and I had two weeks of pretty well normal. So I think by the time I finished that first cycle, I knew that I was on to something really massively effective. And I was just um, at that point, I mean, you lose your hair before the second treatment. So the first treatment, you take it and with 14 to 17 days later, your hair falls out. Um, and so, you know, by the time I go for my second treatment, I'm bald. And it's, it's February, like, it, it, but Canadian February, like it was freaking cold. Um, and I, I, I just wore a hat for five months, right? Um, a toque. Anyways, I guess probably I would say to that question that by the end of the first cycle, I knew that this was going to work. And I was on top of it. And I felt so empowered by that. Um, that's when I started blogging uh, what I was doing. And then shortly after that, I had friends who kind of went you know you write well you should think about a book and it's like you know a book would get this out to more people and um so I started working on a book and I mean I had lots of time that winter because I had cleared a lot of responsibilities out of my life to make room for cancer and cancer treatment so um so yeah I I started working on the book you know I want to I want to say this I don't have cancer but if I do, this, your story has really changed my perspective on it. And I, I am not as scared anymore. Just reading up your book, Hacking Chemo, and, and just talking about how, uh, how you have managed uh, chemo with fasting and uh, strict ketogenic diet. And... I believe that your book 
will really help so many people. And, and, and because I believe that fear, like I said in the beginning, fear is something that is another factor uh, in terms of how you will be, you know, how you come out of this successful, right? And because, you know, having that fear going into it, you know, we're all humans. We, we, we feel scared. Obviously, chemo is such a, such a, the C word we, we call cancer. Is such the big a, C. The big yeah. C is such a, such a big word. And, and you know, it just scares us. I, I'm scared of it. Uh, and uh, your story, reading your story gives me a lot of hope and, and will give people a lot of hope. And I'm just really thankful for you and for talking well, thank about you. this. Um, you know, it, interesting you say that because um, I knew that I was not going to go into this as a victim. Um, you know, there, there's a bit of a victim mentality with cancer where you just kind of give over control of everything in your life to the doctors and you kind of go, oh, God, um, you know, do whatever you need to do. And I was not going to be a, whole, a helpless victim. But I also knew that I wasn't going to be a warrior. I don't like the, the imagery of the warrior because someone who is battle ready is under an incredibly stressed situation. Like, you know, you, and you can't be battle ready all the, every minute of all the time. You, you know, there, there needs to be a place in life for peace and contentment. And what I decided instead was that I was coming at this thing from a position of love. And I was going to you know, not think that my body had betrayed me or any of those sorts of things. I wasn't going to be angry. I wasn't going to be fearful. And I wasn't going to be, um, you know, a victim or, or a warrior. I, I came at it from um, literally a, a situation of self-love. Because one of the things that I realized, and people don't get this, is that cancer is not a foreign invader. You know, people think it's an invader and you got to cut it out and, you know, Cancer is yourself. Cancer is your own cells that have become misguided and damaged and they, they need to go away, um, but they are still yourself. And so you can't, you can't hate yourself because that's just, that's, as, that's a, as bad or worse than the fear that you're talking about, right? Um, and so I, I, I liken it to the Marie Kondo, you know, magic, you know, the magical art of tidying up that sort of idea. And Marie Kondo says, she's that little Japanese lady. She says, uh, if something doesn't spark joy in your life, thank it for its role in your life and let it go. Mm. And it's like, that's kind of how I approach the whole cancer thing. It's like cancer brought me to a whole different understanding of the power of nutrition and what I do. And it gave me a new path in dietetics in my career and in my life. Um, it, you know, it led me to being a published author. It led me to doing things like this, and putting my, my name and my face out in the world. But I could say thank you for that and let it go. Like, okay, cancer, thank you, but you need to go now. <laughs> um, I still plan to live to 95 and die with my boots on, which is what I've been saying for years. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a really important message. Love. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I totally agree. And, and I, I totally agree that, you know, our experiences leads us into our path because every, 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 um, struggle that we face is part of our journey and whatever it is I think you have to embrace it because this is who you are you this is your path and you can't be defeated if if a of, of one roadblock it's always gonna be um, it you know for first of all everything passes right and and second of all everything that every struggle every obstacle that's in front of you sometimes it's, that comes with fear almost but sometimes it's just all in our head and 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 there are things that you can control like like what you said in the beginning 
Um, you controlled what you can control. You, you did your own research. You didn't become a victim. You did your own research. Um, you decided that this is your fight and, and whatever you can do, whatever you can control, you will control. You control your diet. You controlled fasting uh, before chemo. Mm -hmm. You controlled all of that. And, and now you're here in a much better place, talking to people, helping people that, you know, needs to hear your story, really. And, and, and you talk about your experience becoming your own mission. And, and uh, this, this is so amazing, Martha. I want to talk to you about um, coaching as well. And, and, and I know it's, it's, such, it's so difficult to tra transition from lifestyle to lifestyle. It's not that easy, obviously. Uh, we talk about cancer metabolism, which means, which leads us to connecting sugar and cancer. How do we um, help people transition into a new lifestyle? Now, understanding that I have cancer, how do I, uh, where do I start? What's, what, what, what's the, my mindset getting into this new lifestyle? Well, I think... You can start long before you get a cancer diagnosis, for sure. You can start right now where you are um, and know that everything that you put into your body will have an effect on something in terms of your life. So prevention is fabulous and something as simple as um, just transitioning away from ultra processed foods, which is anything that comes in a package or a box um, with a, you know, a, a label on it that has been made of in industrial agricultural products that have been deconstructed down to their basic bits, like their basic molecules, and then reconstructed in something that sort of looks like food, but it isn't. Um, and so I usually tell people that if nothing else, knock the, the sugar out of your life, um, as close to hundred percent as you can manage. doesn't mean I don't have a bottle of ketchup in my fridge. I do. Um, but you know, for the most part, get all the sweet stuff out of your life. Um, find alternatives to sweet. If you, once you get away from sugar, then once you start eating something like a handful of grapes, they will taste like, you know, the most sweet, wonderful things. A gala apple will be super, super sweet, right? When you're not um, dull, your, your tastes aren't dulled by sugar. Secondly, get rid of all the industrial seed oils. So that's soya and canola and corn oils that have been produced again from those industrial agricultural products that have been all chemically extracted and chemically deodorized and all kinds of terrible stuff. That those two things alone will put you probably 50% of the way to healthy even if you never worry about, you know, a piece of bread or something. Thirdly, if you're going to use grains, use organic grains. So that, you, you know, obviously a keto diet doesn't use grains, but, um, you know, a moderate low carb diet, or even if other people in your household are eating grains, get, get organic grains because you will be avoiding the glyphosate or the Roundup, which has been sprayed on those crops. And that too is very much a cancer risk. But if you've been diagnosed with cancer and you really want to, um, to discourage the, the growth and, and the health of the cancer itself, then using um, at least a, a fairly significant low carb, if not a fully ketogenic diet, will take you a long ways towards having the treatments be more effective because you're stressing, you're, you're applying that stress, that, that press that Thomas Acri talks about. Um, and I, like I've been, I was well fat adapted before all this started. So it didn't take much for me to, um, to, you know, move into a hardcore keto diet for the five months that I was in chemotherapy. That's not where I live all the time. I live a moderate low carb um, diet with the occasional foray into something that's a treat um but you know because life happens and and i enjoy every bit of it and when i travel i eat anything because i believe that food is part of the experience of another culture 
Um, so, but most of the time my food is whole food and it's locally produced as much as I can. I'm lucky to live in a rural area where I know the farmers and I can buy meat off somebody's front porch. Um, so those, those things are really important. But if somebody is looking for actual coaching, I have set up um, a coaching practice um, called the Cancer Doula. So because of my license, I can't, um, I can't practice as a dietitian outside of the province of Ontario and a couple of other um, Canadian provinces that have arrangements. But, um, but I can operate as a health coach. And so the Cancer Doula program is just me helping people to understand the things that they can do to help themselves through the cancer process. Um, a doula is a person who helps somebody go through a medical process as opposed to being someone who applies the process. So in, in terms of birth, the midwife first the baby, the doula is there to support the mother. That's kind of why the doula um, image is one that works well for me in terms of helping somebody. I'm not treating the cancer, I'm helping the person who's going through cancer treatment. Wow, Martha, Martha Tettenburn. Uh, guys, get this book, Hacking Chemo, Using Ketogenic Diet, Therapeutic Fasting, and a Kick-Ass Attitude to Power Through Cancer. We will leave uh, uh, everything linked down below so you guys can check that out. I had a blast. This has been a blast, Martha. Thank you so much once again for sharing your story, for being here, definitely helping a lot of people. You know, uh, you've helped me. You've impacted me already. Just reading your book and, and listening to you talk about how you got through it, you know, pushing through um, with, with that right mindset. So thank you so much, Martha. I appreciate you. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's been great to visit with you and to help your audience. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.